Uh, open uh, to the book of Jonah. Jonah uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. You can find that in the Pew Bibles on page 774 or the large print Bibles on page 970. The book uh, of Jonah chapter 1, starting in verse 1. <coughs> Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. This is God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. May he write its eternal truths on each of our hearts this morning. Now you'll notice uh, Jonah, not a particularly long uh, book, uh, we are going through it this summer and hope to be done with it uh, before uh, the fall, certainly. Uh, but uh, it's a book, hopefully, that we can dig uh, our teeth in a little bit, uh, learn a bit more uh, about uh, Jonah, uh, not just uh, sort of proving, as uh, sometimes needs to be done, that uh, uh, Jonah really was swallowed by a great uh, fish. I uh, believe that certainly to be the case. Uh, but to understand, hopefully, the role of the prophets a little bit better. To understand uh, why God sends these often weird and peculiar people uh, into uh, his divided kingdom at this time. Uh, what are they here for? What are they doing? Uh, Jonah, even, uh, is assigned, as we see in verse 2, a very strange a place to go to uh, the north, to the Assyrians, uh, uh, a land, a people that in uh, less than 50 years will come and wipe out uh, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. But yet that judgment, that uh, destruction is going to be delayed largely through the ministry of Jonah, as we will see. Now, uh, we, we don't know a, a whole lot about Jonah uh, in particular. Uh, the time period of his uh, life uh, seems to be uh, around 780, uh, 780 years before uh, Jesus' birth, uh, down maybe between 780 and 740 uh, BC. Keep in mind that 722 is when uh, the Northern Kingdom is destroyed, uh, an important uh, landmark date in biblical history. Uh, we know that uh, Jonah's name in Hebrew uh, allusions to that. Uh, if you recall uh, the dove that Moses sent out uh, looking for uh, land to land on, a safe place to land upon, uh, possibly uh, with Jonah's uh, ministry, he sent out to look for uh, those faithful to God, a safe place for the people of God to uh, uh, abide in. Um, there's an old Jewish legend. I, I found this actually pretty uh, interesting, although keep in mind it is just that. It is a legend. Um, but according to Jewish legend, uh, Jonah uh, was the uh, son of the widow of Zarephath. Uh, in 1 Kings uh, 17, you'll recall the uh, widow of Zarephath, the prophet Elijah, goes and brings her son uh, back to life. Uh, uh, Jewish legend says that that son was Jonah himself. Now, like I said, don't put a whole lot of uh, weight in that, but interesting nonetheless. Um, there's enough information about Jonah and elsewhere in the Old Testament uh, that it gives us a guide and, and a help uh, in our uh, looking at it in this introduction this morning. In uh, 2 Kings now, uh, 14, uh, 23 through 25, we read this. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, often known as Jeroboam II, 
king of Israel, that's the northern kingdom, began to reign in Samaria. And he reigned 41 years. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from uh, Lebo, Hamath, as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath, Hefer. For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel was very bitter, and there was none left, bond or free, and there was none to help Israel. So you see, uh, here's Jonah. Uh, this is why uh, it's, it's safe to place him in this uh, period of time, although, uh, as you can imagine, scholars differ some about when uh, Jonah uh, lived. But in order to uh, understand Jonah's flight from God, we need to, I think, understand this morning uh, that there are three spiritual privileges that we see in these two verses uh, that God has given Jonah and that Jonah enjoyed. And those are service in God's um, kingdom, uh, a sense of his destiny that God gives him, and the fellowship that he has among God's people. So first of all, service in uh, the kingdom of God, where do we see that? Well, we see that certainly uh, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, and said, go. Arise and get going. Uh, I have work for you to do uh, in Nineveh. Now, uh, we see this a lot, actually, in the prophets. Uh, in fact, the most common term for a prophet, uh, the reference to a prophet in the Old Testament is that of servant, or quite literally, a bond slave. This is how he's referred to uh, in 2 Kings 14, servant of the Lord. It reminds us uh, a little bit, doesn't it, of other servants called into service in God's kingdom. Probably the most famous of all, Isaiah 52, 13, the suffering servant passages. That, uh, uh, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. This, of course, is a reference to Jesus himself. And so we can say that in service to the Lord, in service as a prophet of God, sent and commissioned to go, Jonah, in many ways, is modeling the greatest servant of all, Jesus Christ. And so we see God calling his prophets of old to model his greatest prophet, Jesus himself. Famous 3.7 says, For the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants. The prophets. And so again, we see this terminology. It, it, it's a reminder to Jonah, as it's a reminder to all of us who have also not been commissioned to be serving the, in the office of prophets. Uh, that uh, uh, office has largely been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, has been fulfilled in him, but we still are called, we still are, are commissioned as servants of God to go. But, but the connection here is that we are bound as servants of God to live and to understand and to walk according to his statutes as he has laid it down in his word. That the power of the office of prophets, the power of any servant of God, past, present, or future, is how much in conformity we are going to be to God's word. And we must never forget this, that God's word is true. 
Because God's word says it's true. That sounds circular, and it is. But that's the case with all uh, ultimate truth claims. And so we are obligated, we are bound to God's word. And this reinforces to us all the more reasons why we are to attend faithfully to God's word. The second thing uh, that Jonah uh, is given, the second spiritual privilege that Jonah enjoys is uh, a, a sense of destiny. Now, very often, I think we uh, uh, tend to sort of uh, tread lightly on destiny. Uh, we either approach it, I think, like a teenage girl talking about her first love, or we just dismiss it with great suspicion and kind of keep it around somewhere, but we really don't like to think about it or talk about it too much. Uh, there's that, that, that horrible doctrine, right, of predestination, right? Destiny there that always seems to get us into trouble and causes fights and arguments. And so we kind of sort of keep that one to ourselves, you know, and let's not rock the apple cart too much here. We have to be winsome after all, right? But looking at Jonah's life, and I hope this is the case for you as well, looking at your own lives, understanding and having a deep and profound understanding of the sense of destiny that God has placed you in and by which he orders and leads your life. Christian, I would contend with you, is one of, if not the greatest, comforts in this life. Notice for just a moment, if we go back to this 2 Kings 14 passage, notice how terrible society was at this time. Jonah lived in extremely difficult, godless days. We're told that Jeroboam II modeled his father's reign and, and was far better at it in the sense that he was immoral, he was godless. And we're told that he reigned for 41 years. Say what you will about American politics, if you don't like a president, you only have to put up with him for eight years. This is 41 years of moral corruption, pollution of the highest form, godlessness, immorality, not just disobeying or ignoring God, but actively pursuing evil, the text says here. Doing evil, rejoicing in evil, loving that which is sinister and wicked, and not departing from it, but rather leaning even further into it. Brothers and sisters, there are such things as generational sin. And these generational sins, once they have grown up to full maturity, decay a society, and then they tend to morph again into greater and greater forms of evil. That's where the northern kingdom was. Ten of the twelve tribes of Israel, God's chosen people, led away by Jeroboam the first, and now led even further into the cesspool of sin and debauchery by the rest of the kings, sort of coming to a head here under Jeroboam the second. It's not long after this that we see in 2 Kings 23 the southern kingdom, that is the tribes of Judah and part of Benjamin, uh, experience uh, some spiritual reformation under Josiah. But Samaria in 722 goes from bad to worse and eventually it's over. They're done. They are wiped out. When Assyria comes and lays waste to these ten tribes, they never rise again in the face of human history. 
God's judgment is complete. God's judgment is full. These are the days of Jonah. These are the days that Jonah uh, is going through. Does it make you feel a little bit better about our modern age? Maybe a bit, but not to rest too much on our laurels. There's working here for us in America, certainly. But I want you to notice something, because I, I, I promise you, there is great comfort here in Jonah's calling and Jonah's commissioning. We see it elsewhere in Scripture. One of my favorite spots is when uh, uh, Joshua, in the book of Joshua, is getting ready to lead the Israelite invasion into the promised land. And as he wanders around outside of Jericho in the morning, there's a man standing there. You know the story. And he has his sword drawn. And Joshua asks him, are you for us? Or for our adversaries. And you know really what he's asking? Really what the question is there? It's not so much uh, is this angel of the Lord going to fight for us. But really the question is, is Joshua going to fight for the angel of the Lord? And that's the real question for all of us. Whose side are you on? Who are you fighting for? Who are you following after and seeking after? And again and again and again, I think this, this call to faithfulness comes through in, in so many different characters in the Old Testament. Elijah, his predecessor, Elisha. Daniel must face the same question in Babylon. Or think of Queen Esther. Who says, uh, uh, is it that I've been called to such a moment as this for this particular cause? Every single one of them have a profound sense of God's destiny, that it is Him that is leading them into life. It is them that, Him that guards and guides their lives every step of the way. And there's something very reassuring about it. That God has you here this morning for a purpose. That God doesn't arbitrarily or flippantly lead and guide and play fast and loose with our lives. He has purpose. He has meaning. He has a destiny for us. And He ultimately will lead us where He will. But if you're tracking with me, here, we also must keep in mind that oftentimes our destinies for a time in this life will be in sad instances, in difficult times. He will lead you. I think of recently, Pastor Harry Reeder. Some of you know was was really a giant in the PCA, a very uh, uh, fascinating man. I only met him a few uh, times, but but always really enjoyed uh, sitting under Pastor Reader's teaching. Uh, he was tra uh, he was killed. I won't say tragically, but he was killed on May 18th, Highway 41, outside of Birmingham, Alabama. His daughter. Uh, recently, I want to read you just a, a portion of, of something that she wrote uh, on social media uh, uh, about a week or two ago. Started off by writing tragic definition, adjective, dreadful, calamitous, disastrous, or fatal. She says this, I do not want to be accused of being a semantical zealot, however, this has been on my mind for the last two and a half weeks. Many will say in their most well-intentioned, kind-hearted, and gracious ways, things like, I cannot believe Pastor Reader was killed in this tragic accident, or what a tragic event. I fully understand the intention and sentiment behind these comments and appreciate the heart of those who say that. I'm not meaning to parse words. However, words have meaning. 
And what I believe is this, the death of our father and our mother's husband at 10.01 a.m. Thursday, May 18th on Highway 41 in a car accident was not tragic. Was it shocking? Yes. Was it earth shattering to us? Absolutely. Was it devastating, mind-numbing, soul-shaking, heartbreaking, body-aching, overwhelming, and not understandable, for sure? But was it tragic? Never. Our Heavenly Father determined the time and date of Harry Lloyd Reader III's entrance into this world and exit into heaven long before Harry Reader ever existed. She goes on to... To conclude, she says, We choose to lean into the preordained, predestined, and pre-appointed time of our dad's time on this earth. And while we never saw it coming, our sovereign God did. We now have a faint grasp of the promise of the peace that passes understanding. While we don't understand it, we have peace in knowing God, our Father did not get played by some tragic twist of fate. He made his entrance into glory at the exact moment and the exact time and the exact way he was meant to do so. And there is nothing tragic about that. <coughs> the Reader family was at General Assembly uh, this week. I saw them uh, only from a distance. But even the fact they could be there, I think, speaks a little bit uh, to uh, the Lord's peace and comfort that he brings and gives to his people in their understanding and knowing more and more that all of our lives, all of our families' lives are in the almighty hands of our great and gracious Heavenly Father, that he has a plan for your life, that he will see it through to the very end. And if he sees to it to uh, allow or to not prevent tragedy from coming into your lives, or heartbreak, or, or uh, whatever it may be, know that he has a purpose, know that he has a reason for that. And so God's servants like Jonah need to keep that in mind as we continue on and draw great hope and comfort from that. I think we can say at this side of Jonah's life, Jonah had no idea, never dreamed he'd ever end up in the belly of a great fish. But yet God had a plan. God had a purpose. God is controlling the destiny of Jonah's life as he controls yours. The third and final thing, uh, I know we must be brief with this last point, but the last fellowship. Now, uh, all of the passages, I, I won't read them for you from 2 Kings here, uh, but it as you look up some of these references, um, there's a group of people that are mentioned here. And this is significant, I think, in understanding Jonah a little bit better. Second Kings 2, 3, for instance. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, uh, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Uh, there's this group. The sons of the prophets that arise again and again and again, especially in uh, the book of 2 Kings. And we can say with some certainty that Jonah was likely uh, affiliated, if not uh, a direct part, of these sons of the prophets. And so I want you to think about, just briefly, what that means for Jonah. The education that he would have had sitting under or at least being connected to men like Elijah and Elisha, getting to see perhaps the miracles that God performed through them. 
the greatness, the encouragement that would have come from seeing, from knowing. You know, sometimes the greatest encouragement that God's servants need are just simply to be reminded that you're not alone in this fight. And these sons of the prophets, I think, would have certainly provided that for uh, Jonah. There would have been a great fellowship as they invested themselves in prayer, discussion, evangelism, perhaps. Or maybe just the sheer exhilaration of seeking to discover the will of God for their own lives. So this is what God has in store for you. This is the purpose for you. But we also need to keep something in mind here as well. And I think there's great... Uh, teaching here and great warning for all of us. And it's quite simply this, despite how well Jonas, uh, Jonah appears to begin here, Jonah stumbles greatly as we're going to see next week. Raised up, instructed, trained, discipled, led by God, understanding his calling, understanding his sense of purpose and God's destiny in his life. In spite of all of that blessing, <coughs> Jonah falls short. He sins, he flees from God in the very next. No past privilege nor all past privileges combined in your lives. No past obedience, no more fruitfulness and service can ever substitute for present obedience to the word of God. Let me say that again, that no past obedience nor fruitfulness and service can ever substitute for your present obedience to God's word here and now. Great blessings in this life, great spiritual blessings only bring present fruitfulness when they are met with continuing obedience to God's word. And so we must ask ourselves these questions. Am I living with only the memories of obedience in my life? And am I substituting my past spiritual record for the pressing responsibility of present submission to the will of God? Are you remaining faithful? Are you continuing to press on to the goal uh, that is before us? That crown that we receive in glory as we see our Savior face to face and hear his words, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to leave it there, but I can't. Because elsewhere, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, 22 and 23, if you want to look it up, you will see that it is entirely possible for men and women, boys and girls, to say to Jesus Christ, Lord, Lord, did we not do many mighty works in your name? But through failure, fully and wholeheartedly to serve Jesus Christ to the end, we'll hear these words. And I quote directly from Matthew 7, I never knew you. Depart from me. Brothers and sisters, be warned that past privileges and blessings serve them only to magnify the shame of our disobedience. And so how much we need to take to heart that it is one thing to journey of faith, and it is still yet another to finish the course with joy. How do you do that? Will you continue, continue to seek your heart, in your heart, 
those sins that are still there. You ask the Lord to work repentance continually in your life. Repent of those sins. Continue that pattern on. Knowing that Jesus, because of what he has done, and because of his continued reign in our lives and yours, always forgives us of our sins when we ask with an upright and obedient heart. And that I pray, Christian, as you this morning, I trust is you, that we press on, no matter where you are in life, no matter what you've done, yes, we can sin still uh, as Christians, and we sin gloriously, but there is not any sin that Christ's blood cannot atone for, so put your faith in him, trust in him, continue to seek his faith and see how faithful he is to us who are sometimes on Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice in the forgiveness of sins that we have in your son, Jesus. Continue to point us to him. Continue to assure us of our salvation in him. And give us what we need today to continue on in obedience to him. Looking. And knowing that you have uh, good things in store for us, even though they may hurt at times. But that you will lead us every step of the way. 